All right, so as I mentioned, uh, we're going to look at models today. Um, so the key to remembering this, and it's almost like sort of like data sets like last week, the key to, to remembering models is like every model does one thing really well. So um, I think we talked about how, you know, like there's this idea of like general AI, which is like robots and like death machines and all that sort of stuff. And where we are now is like narrow AI, which is it does one thing really well. So each of the models I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you like basically what the one thing it does well it is. Um, and I recommend maybe for this class just to try and stay within the bounds of that, uh, just because if you try to break those rules, sometimes it just never works and you will feel frustrated. So it might be better to sort of start by just following the rules and then we can start breaking the rules like after class, like either on Slack or whatever. Um, but yeah, so every one of these does one thing really well. Um, so I'm just going to run through all five um, and then we'll jump back and forth between doing demos in uh, every application and not. So the first one is style transfer. Um, so what does it do? So style transfer applies a texture of one image to, a co to the content of another image. Um, and I'll show an example of that. So for example, I think I was showing this earlier. So this is an image of flowers, or Jerry and style gain, and then it applies a texture on top of that. So what you get is you sort of get like the content of the image, right? You can see where the flower petals are. You can kind of see where like the stalks of the flower are. But then like the texture and like the detail and the style of it themselves come from the style image. So this happens to be trained on like um, kind of like a swirly kind of colorized image. Um, so you can sort of see like where it picks up some textures that probably wouldn't be in the original image. And I have an example of this uh, later. So also with every one of these models, I've linked to like the GitHub repo, which is the repo that we're using in, on Paperspace. It's there if you need it. Like you don't actually need it because I've installed everything for you. Um, and I'm also linking to the paper. So papers are, uh, because machine learning is a part of data science, uh, a lot of scientists and other people working in that field, they write papers, which is like how they uh, get clout on, in their industry, um, basically describing both what the thing does and then also the math behind it. So if you're really interested in math, uh, which we won't get into in this class, like you can click on this paper and like you can read pretty much in depth how they built stuff. Um, it also explains like some some features that are maybe available in the repo that like we won't explore in this class, but are some other ideas from it. So these two are here if you want to dig in, dig in later. Um, but the thing to remember about style transfer is that its input is one content image and mm -hmm. one and one or more style images. So you can do multiple style images um, in at least in the repo that we have on Paperspace. In places like Runway, they only uh, they only take one style image as an input. So that's another thing to remember is that Runway can be limited in what you can do, whereas the paper space model will give you like a lot, bunch of superpowers to do other things with it. Um, so you only need two inputs, and this is like why it's pretty easy to do style transfer, and why I'd recommend like if you just want to play around for a little bit, like or a couple hours, like this is a good place to start. Um, and the output is one image, uh, and as I was showing earlier, you can do video, but basically it just means like you're running this over and over again on frames of a video. Uh, there's something a little bit more complicated than that, but that's essentially what it does. So uh, here again, it's two inputs and then one output. So it's like pretty easy to do. Yeah, so here's the video version. This is, I think, a slightly different one than I was showing last week. Or showing earlier today, actually. But it does work. Um, so here's an example of exactly what like this does. Um, so you'll see here. Actually, I don't have a, I don't have a video, an image of the content image here, but I've got two style images, right? So I add this and this to a content image of a flower, and you get this, right? So you can sort of see like where it's picking up some of the reddish textures from this right hand image and applying them to different parts, and then you can see it's definitely picking up some of these like swirly pieces here and applying them to the leaves and other things. Um, and so the way that this works, do I have any of this? Okay. The other thing is like you can also just get the texture but keep the color from the original. So I think what's kind of interesting here is you can see that in this version, it definitely like removed some part that was definitely red at one point. Um, and it just sort of kept everything else. So uh, it's a kind of interesting way to just like change the texture but keep the colors. Um, and then another thing you can do is you can actually say, I don't want any content image at all. And basically, this is what uh, it looks like when it's applying just the textures almost to like a blank image. So you'll see here that it's taking those two previous images and it's just applying certain texture parts. 
Now the other thing that I've done for the paper space library is you can scale those style images to give you different scales of texture, right? And that's one of the things, so um, the, the paper space version that I have is like hands down the best library to use and it's not available in Runway. Um, so there's way more configurations and stuff that you can do within paper space than you could on Runway. So it's like, once again, like that's the reason you might want to use paper space because it's a little bit more flexible. There's other tools in it. Um, there's stuff like you can randomize your seeds to get different values here. Um, you can do scaling. There's a lot of different stuff you can do in this version. Um, but basically like this is an also a cool way to just like kind of create some new textures from, from other images. Um, and so the way that this works is it works on what's called a pre-trained model. So there's a model called VGG. You don't really need to know about this, but I'll just explain it, that has been like pre-trained to look for certain features in images. So what it does, it takes the layers, uh, if you remember that graph I showed in the first week where there were like layers in between inputs and outputs. So those layers can correspond to different features. So what it looks for are what, the, what it calls the texture features. So it's looking for like textured kind of things. And it then applies that to the layers and look for content in the content image. So it's basically doing an additive, like sort of mathematic add between take the layers that show textures from these images and take the layers that show content and structure from these images and add them together. That's like way easier, than, or like that makes it sound way easier than, than the math provides, but that's essentially all that's going on. So what you'll also find is like what we might consider texture, which would be like, oh, I have a really cool, like, you know, like uh, swirly, or like, I guess maybe like a gradient or something. You might say like, oh, I wish it would apply a gradient to like an image. Doesn't really work like that because again, the features it's looking for are much more like detailed than like a gradient. So if you have a solid color gradient, it's not actually gonna find that as a texture because of the way that pre-trained model works. So I recommend playing with this just to sort of see where you end up with, uh, but you will often find that like the results you expected are not what you end up getting. So you have to play with it a little bit to, to find like an image. Like that's why like this image, because it's very textured, tends to work well with stuff like this. And then this image, I have to play a lot with the scale because sometimes you want like just this detail, but you end up getting the whole image. So it just you have to play with this one to get like cool results. But you can get really cool results. And I would say this is like way cooler than just doing the Van Gogh stuff over and over again, right? So um, that's style transfer. Um, maybe quickly, like let me just jump in and I can show uh, how this would work in Runway. So in Runway, um, there's a bunch of different style transfer models here. Um, most of these work with pre-uploaded images. So if you go to Adaptive Style Transfer and you, so basically the way, uh, if I didn't explain this last week, the way Runway works is that there's a concept of models. These are the, all the models available to you. And what you want to do is you want to add them to what's called a workspace, which is like sort of like your area to work in. Um, so I'm just going to take fast style transfer and add it to my workspace. You can create a brand new workspace and it gets pretty weird and funky. Um, when you're in here, uh, you'll see you have an input image option. And then you have some pre-built, uh, what they call checkpoints, but these are pre-built uh, output images. So like Cubist, I would assume is like a Cubist image. There's clearly a Kandinsky, there's a Google Maps texture, but like you can't choose a texture in this version. So the only one in Runway where you can actually choose the texture is, let's find it real quick, it is arbitrary image stylization. Uh, so you'll see here, you have an input source and an out, and then this should actually be an output source, right? Well, I guess, what it, oh no, what it's saying is like, this is your content image and this is your style image. Um, so I can just quickly grab some images from my desktop to do with this. So here you just uh, pick file, uh, and then you're going to hit open file. Let me just go to my downloads folder and see if I've got anything fun in here. All right, let's try this one. So that has some cool texture in it. Let me find another image, or actually, wait, I'm a, I want to reverse these, don't I? Um, I'll just, so what was the name of that? So off Tumblr. Okay, so this is the content image. So I want to find a content image I think will be interesting.
So let's just choose this image. Okay, so that file is too big. So the other thing is like, Runway is like very specific about exactly how big all your images can be. So sometimes you have to find like a low res image to use. That's definitely gonna be way too big. This one might work, let's try it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good live demo, Derek. So let's take one of these. Let's see, I want this one. Yeah. Um, so now, now with Runway, uh, once you hit run, it's going to start charging me uh, per minute. So what it's going to do in the background is it's going to spin up basically a server, uh, like a paper space server. It's going to load it, and then it's going to run this process. Now there's a ton of other options in here um, that you might, if you want to play it around in runway, you could try with it. So like the first thing is like, look at that. Like I was expecting to pick up a bunch of these details, and it didn't. Um, now, why might that be? It might be that this image is too large. I need to scale it down. Um, it might be, well, actually, let's try that. So let me just find this image really quickly. So the other thing you'll notice is like it outputs to 256 by 256, which is probably this image. Um, so I'm guessing that this is probably much larger than that. So I think what we'll have to do is we'll have to scale it down to match. So let me just really quickly sort of do that. It doesn't matter. I guess probably for now I could stop it. Also, they've given me a ton of credits to teach the class, so I just let it run. Oh, um, <laughs> if they're not generating? Yeah, so as long as this button says running, or it says stop, you're being charged. Um, so I would definitely recommend like for you guys to like hit stop when you're done, and, fit, and maybe debug uh, separately, and then come back to it. Um, I'm just lazy at this point, and I don't mind giving them my money. Um, but let me quickly find where that image was. Putting the client automatically solve it? Yes, it does. Yep. Cool. So let me open this one. So I can sort of tell you that, like, if you want to pick up this texture at this scale, you generally want the sizes of the images to match up. This is why inside of paper space, I have that style scale parameter, because you can do it automatically without having to open it in Photoshop, re upload the image, like that sort of thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller. So I'm just going to make, let's just make this 360. Um, I'll hit OK. I'll save this out as something smaller. Yeah, so one second, and I'll explain what that is, why that is. So... The way that these models work is they load the image at full size. So, and then they look at, they try to compare the textures at the same size. So because this one is like a third of this size, it's probably blowing, this image looks really bigger. It looks bigger to the, um, to the, to the model. Um, so let's see if this actually helps. I don't know if that actually did. Let me just tweak a number here real quick and see if it does anything. Eh, it didn't really do much. So again, I'll also say I think style transfer in Runway is like pretty bad. Uh, so like I would generally do style transfer in paper space. It takes a little longer to get set up, that sort of thing, and it doesn't run as well. The other models are generally like much better in, in, in Runway. Um, let's see what time do we have. I can actually do, let me do a demo really quickly on paper space and show you what it looks like when you do it there. Um, Thankfully, it didn't show my password. That's nice. So in the, in the runway model, you can do you know, one uh, style image. So in yeah. the other model, you can do more. Yep, in the other model, you can do more. Yeah, exactly. So like, I generally will say like runway is good for like pretty basic stuff. Um, but I find it's not nearly as not nearly powerful enough to do the things that I want to be doing in it. 
so again, like, um, just to like reiterate how paper space works, you go in, you find your machine. I happen to have four machines any one time. Um, you probably only have one. You go in here and you, uh, it says start, you turn it on. It's gonna take a little bit of time to spin up. Like I know that this actually isn't ready for me to log into yet, um, but it's there. Uh, the next thing you do is you copy the public IP address. Uh, you go into terminal, let's create a new one. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Uh, and then you do SSH paper space at, and then your public IP address. Hit enter. This might yell at me because it's probably actually not ready to go. And while it does that, I'm going to grab my password. Yeah, see, so basically, if you get this message, that means like even though paper spaces is ready to go, it's not really. So sometimes I just give it another minute and I hit up again. Yeah, and now it's ready. So in here, I have a uh, neural style TF, which is the version of, of the style transfer library I use. So I'm just going to move in there. Um, and then the other thing is, so like uh, we talked a little bit about FTP, and again, like as we work on your project, I'll like take you through these steps a little bit slower, uh, and we'll record those sessions too, so you have them. Um, but I'm just going to really show you like really quickly like how I would work. Um, so in FTP, like I now have access using the same credentials into my FTP library. I now have this folder here. So let me actually like let's just do this. I'm going to actually move in those images. Um, that I saw here. So I'm going to grab this one. I'm going to place this in the styles folder that uploaded already. I'm going to go back in here and I'm going to go to image input and I'm going to want, which one did I grab? That's yeah, a future flower. i got to figure out the name of this thing. This is where I show off how badly I named everything. Don't be like me, kids. If I can't find out, we'll just grab one of these other ones. Well, let's just grab one of these and oh, there we go. That's it. Um, cool. And I just want to grab. Let me just make sure the size is right. So this is a five twelve. I'm just going to drag that into image input. And so, if you're ever not sure on how to run these. Um, I, the link to that GitHub repo is in there, so you can always go back to that. Uh, and there will usually be documentation into how to run it. Obviously, if you're on Slack, you can also just find me and ask me. But this is basically where I want to be. Um, I know all the code is down here at the bottom. So what you want is you want a bunch of arguments. So what you're going to do is you just start building up your script, right? So I'm going to do Python, and then it's... Um, neural style dot py and then let's see so there's an example here so I want content image so let's do content image and then I'm gonna go over here and my content image is named this I'm just gonna copy this name then I want style image and my style image is named this, which thankfully I don't have to type because that would be terrible. And then what else do I have? So what else is here? So there's a thing called max size. So I know I really want the max size to be no bigger than um, what the content image is because otherwise it's going to get fuzzy and blurry. So I'm going to type in 512. Uh, max iterations. So we can talk a little bit about iterations. Iterations are basically like 
What it does, it loops through and it tries to keep making the image stronger as it goes through. So max iteration is basically like a thing like baking, right? If you bake something for five minutes, it's still gonna be lumpy and cold. If you bake it for half an hour, it might get it might be good. Depending on the image, right? Or depending on what you're cooking, you have to run it for the right amount of time, right? So some images might take 300 iterations and it's good. Other images might take a thousand and it's sort of up to you to sort of test and determine what you like. So I generally know that it works fine around 500. Like that's just generally like my starting point. So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna paste this in here, and I'm gonna hit 500. Um, so I think this is everything I need. I don't really care about uh, any of these. So it doesn't like require a certain number of arguments in order to run? No, I think the only ones that are required with this are your content image and your style images, because it has to know what, what it's pointing at, right? Mm -hmm. um, everything else is there's, like defaults. So I think the default for max size is probably 1,000. Um, there's probably defaults for other things, and actually they're probably listed here. So max size, so yeah, the default is 512. Okay. Um, so all these like have defaults built into them. Um, I think the other thing that I want, I want to name this file, because like the other thing is really important is like, as you do this more and more, um, you will undoubtedly end up with like thousands of things all named result if you don't like name them. So I generally recommend naming this. So, and the way that I name these, is I name them so that I remember what I actually built them out of, right? Because sometimes you'll find a beautiful image and be like, how did I make that? What, were the, what was the style image? What was the content image? Where do I, like, how do I find this? So I'll usually like just rename, I'll name these so that they match this. So the image name for this will be like FF15. Hopefully I remember that what that means. And then um, Tumblr LUG. Like in reality, I would probably name those a little bit longer or like just change the names of these, of these files so that it makes more sense. Uh, but I think this is everything I need. I'm going to hit run and see what happens. Cool. So you will get a lot of uh, messaging coming back from this thing. You don't really need to know what any of it means. It's basically just it's running a bunch of different things in the machine side. Um, at some point, I think we're good still. Basically, it takes a little bit of time for this to run. But I haven't gotten an error message back yet. Yeah, so we're still doing okay. But basically, just like uh, with Runway, this is probably what it's doing in, in the behind the scenes, right? It's like loading everything, um, and it's just waiting for it to start running. Now it's a great part of the demo where I can't say anything, but okay. Well, this runs. Any questions about style transfer? Um, the seed for the random number generator, like, is that so that you could kind of replicate the exact way that the style was being applied? Yeah. Okay. So basically, what it does, and this is not true of the defaults here, but you can start with random noise and build off of random noise. So if you want, if you're doing that, and you want to like be able to recreate it at like the same scale or redo it, then yeah, that's what the C generator is for. Um, why is this still not running? This is usually faster than this. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, oh, it's because it, well, I didn't, there's a message called verbose, which will spit out all of the iterations as it trains. Because I didn't put that in there, it just didn't show it. So you can see the, the amount of time it took for this thing to run is 102 seconds. Um, so what is that? That's two minutes. Um, so let's see what it made. So if I go back to my main folder, um, and here's a thing called image output, and in here is a thing called 500, and in here, oh, interesting. Oh, okay, well that's fine. I think I, there's something off with the way I name this, and I have to name it differently. But this is what the image spit out. So that's way better, right, already? Um, and I think it's because of this library that's better. But we can also play with, let's do this. Let's do, let's, so let's repeat that, that command. Um, so you just press up and you get the entire thing all over again. This is really frustrating that like that's all blocked for you, but just trust me, it's there. Actually, here's what I'll do. Hey. 
That also works. Um, oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I can like figure out computer things, but figure out that would have taken me like an hour. Uh, cool. So anyway, so that's up there. Now let's actually do style scale. So um, there's a thing in here called style scale. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to change the scale of the style images. So I know that, that style image is like maybe a little bit bigger, uh, maybe like a third bigger than the other than the content image. So let's just try and match them one to one. So let's just say style scale dot six six six. So that's going to shrink it down uh, sixty six percent. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to figure out what I did wrong there with the image with the folder name. Is there a thing called output here? Ah, image dir output. That's what I did wrong. So instead of name, I would use image dir output. Um, and the reason is that that creates a folder, so then I can go back and find that folder. So I'm just going to use this again. I'm going to say dot slash um, and style scale. So let's run this one again. I didn't put in that verbose, so you can't see it generate. Actually, hold on. I'm just going to quit this now. Uh, if you ever want to quit stuff, you just hit control C, and that will stop any command that's running. So I'm just going to stick in verbose, and that should spit out um, some other stuff about training. Yeah, so see, now you're getting like building the network. This is actually the network, if you know what that means, which you don't need to. And now it's training. So this is at iteration zero. Now it's at 50. So it's basically like, it's, it keeps cycling over this image to try to make it better. <laughs> and like normally I would say, just like cooking, also don't watch this while it's running. It just like feels like it takes forever then. Usually what I'll do is like, again, I'm watching TV while I run this stuff and I'll have like, you know, my screen is doing something else, but I got this open just to check and like make sure it's like not stopped, right? All right, there we go. So that somehow was also faster. I don't think, I mean, it's six seconds faster. I don't know if that had to do with the scaling or whatever it is, um, but clearly it happened a little bit faster. Uh, so now my, my image output folder is here. So that's even better, right? Like now you actually get like those details and you get some of the texture in here. So again, like this is where I would play with this, right? Like I might make it even smaller and see like, do I get something else? Um, like actually let's do this. So if I, I'll just turn down the iterations um, so it'll run a little bit faster and it might not look as great, but it'll still be there. Let's turn this into 0.25. So what's also cool about this library is you can actually see what it did. So one of the things that's here is here's style zero, right? So that's the image it took. That's the image it based it on. Whereas if we look at this one, which is the first iteration, you'll see it took, took a much closer crop, right? Because they have to match. The, the image size has to match. So it probably picked up more of this, which has less texture than this. So that's part of what I'm talking about is like when you do scale, you can sort of see what it's doing behind the scenes. But what I also like about this library is then you can also see exactly what you did, right? Um, and what's nice here as well is if in, in metadata.txt, this is all of the settings you provided it. So if you want to remake that exact same image, you could input in this these same parameters and you would get the same image, hopefully. All right, cool. That took, wow, okay, that took like a quarter of the time. All right, well, let's see what that one turned out. <clears throat> Oh, it's kind of 200 instead of 300. 
So now we're getting really like nice detail there, right? Um, and if we look at what the style image did, or what the crop was, so see now it was picking up like really tiny little hairline details. How does it generate that? So basically because the images have to be the same size for this library to run, the only way to like make this smaller than the content image is to replicate it. Okay. Like you basically you could like have it spread and just have it be blank, but then it would only pick up this in one place, right? So um, this is what I found just works well, is like just to do some mirroring. Also the mirroring is nice because then you get different textures in different directions. Um, so this is the neural style library, and like I, you'll see it's like way better to use than the runway version. Um, but if you want to play around and just sort of like see what you can get out of runway, you're more than welcome to. Um, but this is the library that's on your paper space machine. And so I've recorded this so you can like go back and obviously this is something you want to work on in more detail. Like we can go over how to like do other things with it. Um, I didn't show you how to do multiple images with it, that sort of thing. Yeah. Cool. Um, I just had a question about like the cooking time, so to speak. Yeah. Like, like that one had fewer iterations, but it seems like it turned out okay. Like, like how do you know if something is like under cooked or? <laughs> so it's really that's really or it's really up to you. Uh -huh. um, like, so what would overcooking look like versus undercooking? Well, why don't we do this? Why don't Why don't I run it for two thousand iterations? We'll come back to it and look at it. Um, so basically, I'll keep going through the class, but I'll run this in the background, and we'll just sort of see um, what it looks like. So wait, so what did I? So well, the other thing is we also changed the scale. So let me go back to this scale, and let me do iteration. Let's just do two thousand iterations, and we'll come back after uh, the next model, and then we'll look at it and see what happens. Because this is going to take, this will probably take five to ten minutes to run. Um, cool, so while this runs, I'll keep going on the other models. Uh, so style transfer, style transfer is like dramatically different than the other models um, because it works off of a pre-trained model. Um, and that's why it needs less images because it's actually been trained to already run. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about picks to picks. Picks to picks, if you remember, is like funny cat drawings or redrawing of maps. Basically what it does is it pairs two images together, right? So in this example, what it was trained on was it was trained on images of cats, and then some poor data science intern went in and outlined all the shapes of the cats. By outlined its eyes, outlined its nose, like did a bunch of stuff to get that shape of the cat. Trained it on a thousand of those, and then you can do fun stuff like this, like drawing a, a funny looking cat, and you get a weird looking animal out of it. So what does pix to pix do? So it generalizes correlations between two paired images so basically what that means is it figures out how to translate one image to another. Um, so in that example, it was outlines of cats to the, to the full cat, or a photo of the cat. So the training data for this is a folder of images, let's call that A, and a folder of directly correlated images B. So what I mean by directly correlated is it's basically the exact same image, just with something done to it, right? So if you take a photo of a cat and you outline that photo of a cat, the outline has to, like basically it's like almost like an onion skin, it has to match up exactly. Like if you were to place them over, if the outline were slightly off, it would mess up the model. So what's really tough with this one is you have to do some a lot of either Photoshop work or other work to make this one happen. Um, but you do get some cool results out of it when you're done. Uh, so the input. So this is for testing. So the training model takes 300 photos of cats, 300 directly correlated images of those same cats outlined. You train it on that, and then when you test it, you give it an image of either the cat or the outlines, and then it gets you gives you the reverse, right? So if I give it an outline of a cat, it's going to give me the cat as a photograph. That's basically what we saw in that first image. But I could also give it a photo of a cat and the hope is it would give me the outline. So it's kind of interesting in that you could actually get both back if you wanted to, but it kind of depends on like what you're training it on, right? Or like how, let's say I only train it on cat faces. Like, so I just do a cat face and I just outline its ears and I outline its nose, and I train it on that. If I then feed it a cat body, expecting it to give me the outlines of the body, it's not gonna work. So the thing that is really important is like, when you train it on something, you have to train it on either a very, narrow set of data, which you only need like maybe a hundred, a couple hundred images of, or you have to train it on like a very broad set of images, 
like I want a cat face, I want a cat body, I want a cat laying down, I want a cat sitting in its cat position, and then you need a lot more data. So like that's that's one of the things is like remember like what you're training on also determines what it's going to output to. Oh, so this is a great example. So this is probably what it trained it on, or like something similar to this, right? So you get an outline, you get a little nose, you get an ear, um, you actually get its arm, which is important, and then like this is so like this is probably the input image, and this is the paired thing that I trained it with. Um, so like that's an example of like this is probably the right amount of level of detail in order to train it, and then you can test it by feeding it back just this image, and you get both. Uh, so similarly, like other ways you can do this is instead of just outlines, you can do color segments. So this is a map, I think, of Venice. So you take this, you can probably find these on Google, you can find them on a bunch of other sites. You take that image, you then segment all the colors, right? So red means buildings, white means uh, roads, and blue means water. So you probably have to, again, like find 500 photos of Venice or 500 photos of other cities with like water bodies next to them, train it all together. And then you can start drawing weird stuff in those same colors, and it's gonna try to convert them to what it was trained on, right? So all the blue is water. It's kind of funny that it's greenish. Um, I guess it's probably because the Venice water is kind of gross. Um, all the green is supposed to be like, uh, like park or trees. The red is supposed to be buildings. It probably got trained on more than just those red buildings. It probably got trained in other cities. So it also is pulling in some blue, maybe it's probably glass, it's probably glass buildings. Um, and then white is roads. You can kind of see that kind of works, right? You get like a little bit of, sometimes you get uh, pavement, sometimes you get like dirt roads, other things. Um, so this is an example of like, again, like they had a bunch of training data, and then when they fed it was like an interesting, weirder thing. Um, I personally, let me see if I have more for picks to picks. I don't. I personally find picks to picks to be the hardest thing to work off of because you have to both find the data and do a lot of manual work to make the paired data set. Um, so unless you're like absolutely in love with this concept, I wouldn't recommend it for this class. It just takes like double the time to do to do to make a data set out of it. Uh, but let's look at like where this is in runway. So if I go back here and I go to the model section and I go to picks to picks. So someone already has picks to picks uploaded, so I'm gonna add it to my workspace. Um, and the input here is a file, and there's facades, facade labels to photos, or day to night. So I believe day to night, the other thing that's nice about uh, Runway is if you go in here and you go picks to picks, and you go to learn more, they will generally at the bottom here have, again, the GitHub repo and the paper. So if I go to this GitHub repo, and I go into data sets, See, it doesn't have, so I bet like, I bet day to night is basically it'll turn a daytime picture into a nighttime picture. So what I would do, um, because these are already pre-built, and again, like this is a place you can't train in runway. So you can't create your own training data and then, in, and then use it in runway. Uh, you have to train on paper space and then through some semi-convoluted steps, like have to bring it into runway to test off it. So I would generally say if you're gonna do a pixel pix model, you should train it on paper space and also test it on paper space. It's just a little easier that way. Um, but because pix to pix already has uh, its own data sets already trained in here, so like day to night, so let's just pick that one. I'm gonna quickly find a photo of like, um, let me just do landscape. So let's grab this image. Holy shit, that's huge. download that. I'm going to make this much smaller inside of Photoshop really quickly. So then here I'm going to open the file, grab this guy. Uh, so another thing just to remember is like the reason I made that smaller is the bigger an image is, uh, the longer it's going to take to run, and or it just won't run at all. 
like a huge image through text to text just basically won't work um, because it's going to max out the memory on the on the server it's running on. Uh, so I find generally like I can probably actually make this smaller. I generally find something that's like 500 pixels like works well in runway. Um, so I'm just going to run this remotely. And I should also note, you have to pick the checkpoint or like the data it's been trained on before you hit run. So if you were to check facades knowing you wanted to do day to night, you'd have to stop it and start over. Um, because as it's starting up a server, it's also downloading all that data. Um, so you basically like, you can only run one of these at one time. Um, if yeah. You Yeah. Would that result in something? Uh, probably. But what you would get is, I don't know. Like, it's like, you could try it. Um, the next model we'll show, which is CycleGAN, is better for something like that. But we can, like, it's something if you want to try, you could try it. I just, you never know if it's going to, like... So the thing that I always find interesting, again, like, you have to think about how a machine reads or how a machine looks at things. You don't actually know what it's con making connections between, right? Because those deep layers. So you might say like, oh, well, there's like green here. You should be understanding like green converts to blue. But that isn't always how it works. So it's just, it's kind of a trick to figure out. Okay, so day to night, turn this to this. I mean, so again, it's important to know like, well, what was this trained on? Was it trained on highway scenes? Was it trained on city scenes? Did it include lakes in landscapes? If it didn't, then it probably doesn't know how to convert a, a lake at during the day to a lake at night. So again, it's in, like this is why it's important to learn what the pre-trained stuff is already trained on, because then you're going to get better results. Or you train it yourself, right? If you're like, I absolutely only want to convert day to night from land uh, landscape scenes with water features to landscape scenes with night features, like then I have to train that myself. Also, find that data is going to be a huge pain in the ass, but you could do it. I assume, maybe. Um, but yeah, so basically, like, you can see, like, eh, it, I get that it kind of got an idea of what it should look like, but it's clearly not good enough. Um, so again, just like think about, you know, what this, what this is, what it works. What, like, this is also the funny thing about machine learning, right? Is like part of the class is like you'll learn these things suck. They're like not good. They're like not gonna learn. They're like, you know, people will people say like oh, AI is going to take over the world in a decade, and you look at this and you're like, absolutely not. That's not going to happen. Um, so, you know, uh, part of this class is learning, like, hey, these things actually suck, and, like, it's okay that they suck. So that is picks to picks. Um, really quickly, I'm going to jump back to our model here and see if this stops. So it did. So this one that took 2,000 iterations took 356. What is that? That's six minutes. Yeah, so like six minutes. It's actually pretty good. Paper space is like a very fast server, so it will generally run a little bit faster than other servers I use. Um, but let's go over here and check this one out. So 2000. So that's comparing to this. So this is 2000, that's 500. So you'll see it does look a little different, right? Like this one, which is less iterations, has more texture here than it does at 2,000. So this is really, it's up to you as the artist, right? Which of these do I like more? Which of these is like closer to the visual I had in my head or just something I like more? Um, you can train this thing for like 5,000 iterations and it's just gonna keep, I find it tends to lose a little bit of detail as it bakes more. But like, it feels crisper in its own way, right? So like this, compared to that, like this one feels a little muddy. It's got some texture here that gets erased. Like look up here on the top right, right? So like erases some texture. So you can decide like, which of these do I like more. It's sort of up to the artist to decide. Uh, OK, so next stream prediction. So next frame prediction is actually picks to picks. It's just a very special version of picks to picks. 
I'm gonna play this because I, I just love this video. It like is super cool. But. Okay, so what is this doing? So essentially what this is doing is, so whereas pix to pix is take a photo of a cat and like apply its outlines, this is take one frame of the video and then take the next frame of the video. Then take that frame of the video and take the next frame of that. And it does that over and over and over again. And the hope, if this were like a perfect machine learning model, is it would learn to guess what the next frame of a video is, right? So then what you feed it is you feed it the an image and it should be able to create a video from it. And you'll see like, I mean, you saw it was like, it kind of got it, it got like some of the movement, but it, it's not good. It's like not perfect enough to like actually recreate an entire video. Um, so yeah, it's a special version of Pix2Pix and it just uses uh, like next frames to sort of guess. Um, there's a tutorial, this is basically the tutorial that like is basically the library that we use for it. Um, so this is like, if you want to read through that, this will like this gives a much better explanation of what it's doing, um, as well as some tricks and like other things within that system. Um, I uh, people last class really enjoyed this one because it's really easy to find a video dad said, right? Like, not hard to go on YouTube and like use YouTube downloader and like download a video and then play with it. Uh, the results are pretty interesting, right? Like that video was pretty great. Um, and then what you do so in training data, you feed it the video. Basically, like, there's a library here with steps that breaks it all up into frames, and then there, uh, pairs all those frames, then does the training for a while, and then when you're done, all you have to then do is feed it a, a single frame, and from there it tries to figure out the rest of the video. So what Jonathan did in that uh, roller in roller coaster video is he sort of like stitched the two videos together, right? So you could see where it was like training on something, and then there was a moment where it just switched over. Um, and also, this is another one where baking comes into play, right? So the longer you train this one for, the slightly better it gets at like learning stuff. It's never going to get perfect just because of the way. It, basically, what what we've what people have sort of figure out is they actually need to train on more than just one frame previous. They actually need to train on multiple frames previous, but that requires like, a custom setup. Um, but basically, like it'll never get perfect, but it will get different outputs. Um, so actually, I probably have a couple here um, that I can show you of like some next frame stuff I've done. Actually, let's do this. Let's go to my YouTube. Did you feed it a video where like a lot of the like scene is like stationary for most of the video? Will it like understand that and keep that sort of stationary? And so that's that's definitely one of the things you have to find about uh, doing next frame prediction is you have to find a video that works well, mm -hmm. and not all videos work well. Um, that's like one of the biggest like struggles is just trying to figure out what is going to work right here and what isn't. Um, all right, crap! I don't have one of these here. Let's go to. Yeah, so I generally find, and that's why that roller coaster one works well, is because there's not a lot changing, right? Like you sort of have that frame that's still there. If you were to just like train it on like a, a movie, where like there's constantly different cuts and there's different scenes, it's never going to learn what the hell is going on with that. So you have to be like pretty careful about like what you're showing or like what it's being fed. Uh, yeah, so this was uh, Mario Klingemann's piece. This is Train on Fireworks. So it's like it learns parts of it, but it doesn't learn everything. It learns how to, like, how fireworks streak, 
but doesn't learn that like they always explode from one place and go out from there. So. Do you have to? Does the, your starting image have to be a frame from the video that you trained it on? Or it's usually know? best if it is. Uh -huh. uh, you can try other things, but like so I know. Jonathan, the guy who did that roller coaster video, then took that roller coaster training data and applied it to Mario, like an 8 bit, like the very early Mario game. And it kind of worked for a little bit. It had like the same, you saw the motion of the roller coaster, but it like, all right, it wasn't as interesting to me. Um, so you could do it, it just, it requires a little bit more um, testing with to just sort of figure out like how to do it. Uh, and sometimes it just also doesn't work. It's like, there's so much like testing you have to do with this stuff to see if it's gonna work right that it's a little bit hard to like know for sure if something is gonna work. Um, okay, so that's picks to picks. There's actually no way to do this in runway. So basically, if you want to do it, we gotta do that on on paper space. Uh, cycle GAN. So cycle GAN is another one of these models. It's similar to picks to picks, uh, but it is weirder. Like this is uh, uh, zebras to horses. So this is unpaired image sets. Uh, and it generalizes their translations. So this is a 300, 300 images of horses, 300 images of zebras, and the machine tries to figure out how they connect. Uh, so the training data for this is a folder of, image, of folder of images A and a folder of uncorrelated images B. <coughs> so then, once you've trained it, then your input needs to be two images. So you need to feed it both a horse and a zebra, so it can then output what both those look like in reverse. So if I feed it a different horse and a different zebra, it will take that zebra and try to translate into the horse. It'll take the horse and try to translate into the zebra. So this is like two images in and two images out, uh, whereas pix to pix was one image in and one image out. Uh, this is um, Raman to Faces. Did I show this before? Okay, this is Raman to Faces. The reason I like this, it actually shows how CycleGAN works. So CycleGAN, the way that it tr actually does the training is it's sort of like Google Translate. So it translates from A to B, and then from B back to A. And the way that it knows it's successful is if A looks similar enough to the original A, right? So like you can see like this still came back as ramen. It's fuzzy, but it works. So like, and then here it's B to A. It's B to A to B. So again, it's like, what, what is actually interesting to me is this middle middle layer, like this is where the art is, right? But like, this is how it knows whether it's done well, is how much these two match to each other. Um, so that's CycleGAN. So I uh, this one is done on uh, floral images and then um, like, uh, like paint flow art, like where people like just pour paint on a thing. Um, so like this, you can see it's pulling in textures from floral images, uh, but it still has sort of those swirly shapes like the original art does. Uh, so CycleGAN is, I believe, also in Runway. And so here, so let's do horse to zebras. So if we find a image of a horse, Like searching for horse stuff, you always get the most interesting articles. Why can I not grab that image? It's interesting. Okay, let's do it here. So let's just run this. So you just said it was two images in and two images out. Right, so the way this model actually separates out those, so there's a horse to zebra and there's a zebra to horse. Oh. Runway, because it really only likes to get one image in, uh, it actually will just sort of, it sort of 
does all the stuff behind the scenes, but it like kind of makes it easier for inputs. When you use this on paper space, you do have to provide it two images. Actually, what you do is you provide two folders, and it runs through both folders together. While this happens, I'm going to turn off my paper space server because I realize it's still running. Cool, so that's got the horse here. And this is what it put out as the zebra. Pretty good, actually. Um, I mean, you'll notice that it kind of screws up some stuff in the backgrounds. And again, that's just because what it's been trained on might not have purely clear skies. Like maybe it got a lot of um, clouds in it and it's trying to maybe replicate a little bit of cloud feature in there. Could be any number of things. Um, you'll also, what I think I find is funny is it starts to blend into the fence. Um, now another thing you do is you could try to mess with this model a little bit more. Like what if I fed it, what if I fed it this landscape image? It might not do anything, right? Okay, look, it didn't really do anything. It kind of maybe found some stuff that looks horse-ish horse -ish here, and like clearly like maybe tried to make, so like it found brown stuff in like a certain shape and tried to turn it into a zebra, but it didn't really do much else. So again, like, because these are trained very specifically on certain things, you have to like know what those things are and then be able to match those. So like I'm seeing here, there's another one that's called summer to winter. So let's stop the model. Let's switch to summer to winter, and then let's run it again here and see if we get uh, a wintry image. So another thing is like, you could do picks to picks and look at what it does for day to night. You could then also look at, at CycleGAN and see if it does day to night better, or you could do your own training, right? So like one thing that we've never really tried to like think about is like, is pix to pix actually better? In some ways it might be, but maybe CycleGAN is better in other ways. That's pretty good, yeah. right? Like that one's pretty awesome. Um, and maybe it's just because it got the colors right, mm -hmm. but like it also didn't mess up like the, the reflection, like even the reflection has the right co like coloring in it. So it's pretty good. I mean, it also like converted some of the green to white. It kind of needed to put like white on the trees, but not all the trees. So pretty interesting. Um, but here again, like let me, well, let's do this. Let's do the reverse. What if we gave it a horse? Let's go this guy down. I mean, it doesn't work as well, right? Like, because it didn't really find anything wintry. Like, it didn't find a landscape to work with. It turned the horse blue, which obviously wouldn't be right for winter. And it, but what like, is kind of interesting is it got like a like wintry sunlight out of it, right? So it got some things, but clearly not very good. So here again, like you could play with these and see like what happens if I screw with what it, what it expects. But so far you've seen it like doesn't really work that well. Okay, so that's CycleGAN. Uh, the last one is StyleGAN. Um, so StyleGAN is generally, you will usually see it as like the example of cool, funky animations. Uh, so that, that style transfer video I was showing you, was the, this is the video it was based on. So it added this plus the style. So what does StyleGAN do? So it generalizes the features of a training data to produce new, similar images. Um, so this is the face. This is all like fake faces. This is this is not a flower. This is like basically this only produces the same kind of images. It doesn't do any translation like CycleGAN or Pix to Pix. It just tries to produce the new images using just the features it finds. So the train data for this one is you need a lot of images. Um, I generally would say up to a thousand or more. Um, you could get away with maybe 500 if it's like the perfect set. Um, so that's what you train on. 
Then what you get the output of is, this is where it gets kind of crazy. You don't give it an image, you give it a 512 dimensional vector. So what that means is you basically give an array of 512 numbers between negative one and one. I'll show you why. Um, and then it outputs an image. So what, so again, this is sort of, I think we talked about this a little bit in the first week of class. But basically what this does is this creates a model that is a 512 dimensional space, which our brains can't, we can't actually do that math. So basically imagine three dimensions, but then just like multiply it times infinity, and you will get a 512 dimensional space. What you want in that space is, again, so we talked about this last week, is you want a single point. In three dimensions, that single point could be 0 0.5, 0 0.25, uh, negative 0.125. That's the coordinate for that particular thing in three-dimensional space. So you want a coordinate in a 512-dimensional space, which means you need 512 numbers of, of this. That's all that means. It's just like it's a coordinate in the space that it creates, and that coordinate happens to be an image. Um, so then what you can do, and I, think, I know we talked about this last week, or the week before, then what you can do is you can actually create like a path through the space, right? Like you could say, like, oh, I want to go in here, and I want to go back here. Like, this creates an animation. So that video I showed you is basically like I pick a point start, and I start moving in that space. And that generates a animation because anything in a coordinate space that is very close to each other is, the, is a similar image but different. So as you move, you move, you're basically like animating these features. So in the case of a face, it could be like an image, like a face going from frowning to smiling. It could be eyes going from shut to open. Like, but you're doing that in amongst 512 features. So like lots of stuff is changing as you're, as you're animating through it. Yeah. Is there like a tool that will help you generate the path? I mean, I feel like yeah. Kind of hard to... So well, okay. So basically, what you do is um, for the stuff that I do, I just generate what is basically a circle. Because what I have so nice about a circle is you get it loops. So if you start here and then you come back around, it becomes a looping video. What uh, what we end up doing is then we add noise to it, so it like looks like this. So then you basically what you're doing is touching lots of other features as you go down that path. Um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, yeah. That's how you generate those videos. You get a nice looping structure out of it too. Um, and then it also like kind of does things where it like pops in and out of new features. Uh, so let me just quickly show you where that is in Runway. So I've got my models and I go style GAN. Um, you can just add this one to your workspace. So in here, there are a bunch of pre-built models. Um, so there is Flickr faces. That's like the famous face one. There's portraits. There's bedrooms. There's cats. Let's pick cats because I always love to demo cats. When I run this, But what it's going to load is it's going to actually load, um, and I want to actually use a vector. So it's going to generate a grid. That's going to be a grid of images that are sort of defining a space. Um, and we'll see once it loads. Yeah, so here is there are a bunch of random cats. This is a very broad range of cats, right? Um, this is a sampling distance. That basically means like how wide should these changes be? So if I pick one of these cats, like, let me pick this guy, and then I'm going to just sort of like move around my space. You'll see like here are more cats. You can see like this one might be kind of like this one. Also, those eyes are super creepy. So this, are those all like, AI generated? These are all AI generated generate images, yeah. So now let's say I want to like take this cat. Like this cat looks pretty good, except that neck is a little weird, right? <laughs> Um, so if I actually, if I think if I refresh this, I'll get like a closer set of images. Or actually, let me do this. Let me turn the training, the sampling distance down. Yeah, this is this is a good example. So if you make the distance really 
close. That's like a very narrow slice of the space, right? So like you can kind of see like this is a cat with a bigger face. This is a cat with its head tilted. Um, you know, this is a cat that's a little more gray than pink. Like you can sort of see where the differences are here. Um, and then to make those animations, we use a different program. Uh, Basically, Runway can talk to other applications on your local setup. Um, so using like OSC or just like uh, using your local host, you can ping Runway for other images. So we'll use p5.js, and you can grab other, uh, you can basically like generate that vector, this space, and then for each one of these positions, you ping Runway and say, hey, give me the image of that space. Then you download all those and you convert them to video afterwards. But basically, you get a, you get a thousand frames and you turn that into a video. Well, this is like, what's nice about Runway is you can't do this on paper space, right? There's no way for me to investigate this space and like figure out what's there. Um, the, so the other feature here is called truncation. And basically truncation is, so the theory is like basically if you're at the edges of the space here, you're gonna get like weirder and weirder images because it's not where the space is clustered, right? The assumption is that like anything inside of this sort of space should be like generalized to like more normal looking cats or more um, like statistically like more likely cats, if you can think about it that way. Uh, so if you turn this truncation down, it says give me more of this stuff where it's more statistically likely that I get a cat. And those, are, those start to look like pretty good cats, right? Like those all look like pretty realistic. Um, but if I crank this up, Those are still pretty good looking, but I think it's because I'm in a good space where like there are lots of good looking generalized cats. Well, like this one is a good example. Like, I think it has like five legs or six legs. Like it's just like hard to tell. Um, so the other thing you could do is you could change the sampling distance. And like now we've got that that cat's pretty weird looking. Like, I think it's got eight legs. Um, you also see like the texture is kind of different. So again, it's just sort of like, do I want a realistic looking cat? Then I might turn this down. And if I want like a very narrow animation set, I might turn this down um, just to get a sense of like, or actually like in P5.js, you can set the radius of the shape, right? So if I wanted, if I wanted to touch all of these areas, I do this. And I might even like do this. If I wanted, if I want just like a very narrow set of images, and I want the animation to kind of move slowly or like not change dramatically, I might do like something like this. I might stay within a similar region. Uh, and there's, there's ways to tweak that in P5.js. So that's style again. Um, where do you, in Runway, where would you like, do you, can you only work in those? So yeah, so again, training, you can't train on Runway. So if you want to train on your own images, you have to do that in paper space, and you have to bring that model that it outputs into Runway. Um, and I have, a, I have a way to do that, so if that's something you want to do, we can do that together. Um, but yeah, they only have these sets in here for Runway for you to train off of. So like, there's cupcakes, okay, I don't even know, whatever. Um, flowers, rainbows, bedrooms, cars, landscapes. Also, each of these has a, has a different output size. So Cats was trained on 256 by 256. That means the highest resolution you can get is 256 by 256. Uh, Flickr Faces is trained on 1024 by 1024. So you can get a much higher face resolution out of this. Um, and when you train, you can also train it for resolutions. But you can only you can only ever get out the highest output. So the highest is 1024 by 1024. Um, so if you train at 256, you'll never get out of 1024 by 1024. The size you train at is the size of the output. I think this is what style you need to work on like 500, 1,000 pictures. Yeah. But you technically train it on just two images, and it would just be boring and interpolate between the two images. Uh, so actually what you end up with is, let me see if I have an example of it here. Um, I bet I have an example on, of this on YouTube. So you get a thing called overfitting. This I train on, on um, video, uh, on TV sets. So you notice that there's like never, 
you'll notice it's like not a smooth transition. It's because there's only a small set of data, so it just jumps between them. It like doesn't know how to interpret a space in like a good way. Um, so this is generally like a bad example of data science. Maybe you like the look of this. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting, right? Yeah. So like, again, like you could do it on a small sample set. Just don't expect like a beautiful like video that is flowing and fluid. Um, you'll get just something crappy that like bounces around, and maybe learns a little bit of translation, but not too much. So yeah, two images would just be like it would just ping pong back and forth between those two images, and it would like just it would make them look fuzzy like this probably. Um, okay, so that's it for the models we have. Um, I would say if you're thinking about what you want to work on, I've sort of ordered these in what I think are easiest to hardest. So style transfer is easiest just because it takes two images. You can play around. It only takes five minutes to, tr to, to, to make one. So it's pretty like low level of effort, low level of time commitment. Uh, next frame prediction is a video, so it's like pretty easy to do. Uh, the training takes about an, uh, a day, and you'll start getting cool results. Um, CycleGAN, again, you only need two folders of different images, so it's like, you don't need that many images, maybe 100 to 200 for each folder. Uh, so it's pretty easy. You're going to like go grab those. You could do that by hand and it would work. Uh, StyleGAN is the next easiest one. It just requires a lot of data. And like I said, Pixel Pix is the hardest. It is hard because you have to find a good set of data, and you have to do all the manual labor to like make the segments or like the other translation part to it. It just takes a while. Um, this is why they hire interns to like do those projects for them. So if you're really committed, you could do this by in the next, what is it, two weeks from now is one of our last classes. You could probably do it, but not saying it would be the most enjoyable two weeks. Um, so yeah, so we're done for the lecture now. Um, let me just turn this off.